There are a few injuries that might be mounting up for Washington, but can they still beat Michigan State? Let's talk about it right here on Locked On Huskies. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. another edition of Lockdown Huskies. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen listen of the day. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. We write for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. You can check out all of our written work at si.com slash college slash Washington. And, you know, I got to remind everybody real fast that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Now, Lars Hansen, it's great to have you here with me today. And today we are recording this on Monday afternoon. Everybody knows that, you know, we record this usually a day in advance at this point. So, you know, if, if that's still shocking to you, I, I don't know what to tell you. But we just got back from the, from Kalen DeBoer's press conference and there were multiple injuries that were discussed. Is there any one particular that stands out to you above the rest as, ooh, this one, uh, the, the Huskies are really going to need this guy this weekend? I don't know necessarily if they'll need Fatua to Taylor, but that was kind of the one where it still seemed a little more vague. I mean, we kind of knew Dylan Johnson's going to come back probably this week. There's still, again, they all said working him in basically was the general theme of it. There wasn't any definitive one way or the other. Um, I mean, most likely the ones that we think are going to play are going to play. The ones that aren't like that, Fatua seems to be the only one that hasn't, along with Armand Parker and, and you know the others, but. For the most part, he's been the one that's kind of like, okay, like what, what, what's the actual like scope of things? Right. And so from, from the way for, for me personally, at least from what Kalen DeBoer said, when he said he's working in the same vein at Dylan Johnson uh, as running back Dylan Johnson, who is on track to play apparently this weekend. Um, Ryan Grubb said, yeah, we, we tested him for the game and he was at 94%. Uh, I think it was like a max velocity kind of test, which kind of says a lot. And if, Tui Taylor is in that same vein. I think that's a really promising sign. So I wouldn't be surprised if he does play this weekend. The one for me that really stood out the most was uh, Mateo Mele. And Ryan Grubb didn't really give a definitive answer. He said there are still tests that were run on Sunday, that were run on Monday, and we'll kind of reassess where he is during practice on Tuesday. And we kind of know what will happen if um, if he doesn't play. Parker Brailsford will s- definitely slide over to the starting center. And it's just a matter of where do people slide in around him? Does Garen Hatchett start at right guard? Does Julius Bueller move over to right guard? Does Nick Kalepo play left? Does Kalepo slot in at right guard? There are a lot of moving parts if that is to happen. But Mateo Mele has been really, really solid this year. So that's the one that stood out to me is, ooh, I like just for, for the offensive line's sake, I really hope he's able to play. Yeah, that that is actually a good point, and you know, kind of, it's almost kind of the one that got not necessarily glossed over because it actually was one of the ones that was addressed, and specifically to his to you know about Mateo. But I think the other one was happened so late in the game, it was like, ooh, you know, what really happened? You kind of have to go back and watch the game to see what actually happened. But yeah, it is kind of one where it's good that they've gotten Parker Brillis for snaps in both the first two games at center, and he's. Got he's he came in as a natural center. We have to remember that. So I think it is his natural position. But there is a significant no disrespect to Barker, obviously, but there is a significant experience gap between Mateo Bailey having played all five positions along the offensive line essentially, and Parker, who's a redshirt freshman. Right, and that's something where I think that uh, in the limited reps that we did see Parker play center, that he looked really solid, and it was something where I was like, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm not shocked, and especially if you listen to this coaching staff talk about Parker at any given point, They're like, yeah. No, we, 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 we trust this guy. So I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that that's a bad thing if he had to play center, but the one thing that that kind of does make me question is, okay, what's going on with the offensive line depth and just kind of how does that reshuffle things with, um, you know, guard Memelar obviously is out for the season already. And if, if he's out for an extended period of time, that really does thin out a, a portion of, of depth where we, we came in and we were looking at this team before the season started like, yeah, this is a really talented group, especially along the interior. And being ta- down two guys in there is would would make things look really, really different. Right, and I mean that's kind of one thing that Scott Hub was preaching throughout fall camp, especially was, hey, we need to you know have to have a number of guys. That's why they saw. That's why we saw so many different offensive line units in camp. Most of them were with the second team, and 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 you know. Dylan Morris led offense to view, but Michael Penix did get some reps with Garen Hatchett, did get some reps with, you know, Buelo at both, you know, left guard and right guard and, and Nate Kaleppo. He had some experience with him last season. So there's already some familiarity, but I do think, you know, especially from a, from a performance perspective, you, we Parker has been the one of the better offensive linemen 
in both in both run and pass, where you know the tackles obviously have held up their end as well. So I think all the veteran guys that we expected to show up have. It's just more of a question of what's happening with the interior. And if Mateo, if you take the anchor out of that position, it's kind of like, okay, now now really what do we have? How much more do we have to get creative running the ball and protecting panics? And, and, and Michigan State, who we'll talk about here, they're actually pretty good at rushing the pass this, this year. They came into the last season – as you know, as touted with Jacoby um, Windham, I think. Jacoby Windham, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, he was one of the highly touted guys. Ended up not really producing much in the game. But this season, they've had over they had 10 sacks from the first two games. Now, again, same thing with Washington and with Boise State and Tulsa, opponents being what they are. But that, that, it does pose a legitimate threat, you know, especially from the up the middle perspective. So I want to keep a theme here of me just dunking on Michigan State, which has happened like really, I, I swear, it's been inverted for the most part. This one is, is straight up because. Yes, Jacoby Williams was a big part of this last year, but Michigan State coming into last year's game against Washington led the nation in sacks, and they didn't really get close to touching Michael Penix last year. Not saying that's going to happen again this year, but I just want to throw that caveat in there. And I do want to kind of because I wanted so I want to say one thing really quickly about the offensive line, and it's where does Landon Hatchet fit in all this? And I I kind of want to move on to the defense here, so I just kind of want to throw that out for just people to just kind of chew on. Just oh yeah, that's a good question because. I don't necessarily know if ever burning, you know, an offensive lineman's red shirt, unless he's Orlando Pace or something like that, is ever really a good thing. But I think that that's something where, where does he fit? And does he, does the coaching staff tr- trust him enough to burn his red shirt? Because there was some pretty high praise for him. And then kind of switching over to the, the defense a little bit, because there is some, there are some major questions right now in the secondary, where we talked about Jabbar Muhammad a lot on yesterday's show. But now the depth might be tested a little bit because Asa Turner came out early in the game, did not return. And Devon Banks also uh, came out of the game somewhat early on, didn't return either. And Kalen DeBoer said that there, it kind of that, see, that was the one where you were, you said um, that the Tui Tele one was most questionable for you. The, the answer he gave about both, uh, Devon Banks and Asa Turner was the one where I was like, oh, that doesn't sound good. Where he said, we're working through things, we're monitoring things, and he didn't really give a definitive answer about if they even are, might be able to play. See, that, that, oh, how do I say this? To that, to that note, I think that's also why you just, I, <laughs> I, 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 I there. Go, going into that, hearing that answer, I was expecting them, they would probably both miss a week, right? A- Asa yes. with what it sounded like a concussion. And I think Devon's was more of like an arm, like an upper body injury is what it, what it looked like. Because he was able to walk off the field. I remember that. So it, was, it didn't seem like too severe. It was kind of one of those, hey, we'll just give him the week off. Elijah, he played decently well against Tulsa. So maybe you give him the chance to show up against Michigan State, that sort of thing, because he's actually healthy. So I think, you know, and, and Cameron Fabriculon at safety, I think he – you just lose a little bit of experience there between Asa and Camp Ab. But I think – the coaching staff has loved what he's produced in the fall camp in the first two games of the season. So maybe necessarily that one won't be as big of a loss, but it's certainly from a leadership perspective and kind of how they set up the defense is going to be a significant loss. I have one other thing. And uh, what, what what's the very first thing you said to me this morning when you saw me? It's I, 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 I do. He said, um, or you, you said, you said, make sure that fatty Dixon gets his love too. Because three three targets, no catches. He had a really nice PBU on a deep ball. He did also have a pass interference penalty that was not not the the, the best one I've you know I, I've ever seen. But uh, so he 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 does have some some areas where it's oh yeah I I see why they took this guy. He's really talented, and that's somebody who I I can also see making an impact if Devon Banks does have to miss this game. And you know this, uh, speaking of, of games, if if you need to buy tickets for for any any game coming up, you shouldn't be stressed out about it. And that's why you need Game Time, because buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. You know, if, if you're looking to buy tickets to an upcoming Husky game, you should check out Game Time because they have flash deals and last minute tickets, and they also have easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Whether it's a Husky game, you know, you, you want to go see a concert, the Seahawks, the Mariners, so there's all kinds of things that you can find on Game Time, and that's why Game Time is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country because you can get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You can buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps and you're set, and tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to 
dig through your email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Lockdown College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. All right, this is this is a, this is a fun one. I I feel like we're gonna have some fun with this segment because <laughs> the first thing you said when you popped in here and you looked at the graphic. I, I, I know we, we plan all these things out beforehand, obviously, as well. But the first thing you said when you saw grass field troubles in the uh, in, in the graphic, you said, is this is this really a story? And I, I, I want you to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, because like, it, it's an intriguing anecdote. But, I mean, it's not like they've played, they played what, 30 games, less than 30 games under on, on grass field. So, I so believe, I, I think I believe it's thirty-two, and the record from what I remember off the top of my head, and somebody can correct me wherever they they are listening to this if, if I'm wrong, is fourteen and eighteen since Chris Peterson took over on grass. Okay, so but but like, the, to, to, we didn't care about that stat before Chris Peterson showed up at Washington. Like, was it something that because Chris Peterson played on blue, blue turf at Boise, now we got to <laughs> figure out how does how he does on artificial turf and then on grass? I mean, like, I, I get it. It is it is intriguing, and especially when you know you go on the road and. Michigan State that, that that's you know, it's grass field, so it's one of those. Okay, what? But I don't think. I mean, Boise State noted after the after the week one, after their week one loss, that their players were slipping on the field, but they didn't cite that as a reason for the loss. It wasn't like, oh, hey, you know, we were slipping and sliding, they must have done something to the field, and you know, you know, or we just we were at a total disadvantage. It's like, no, it, yeah, it's a fact. It's, it's an interesting fact, but it wasn't. It doesn't dictate the outcome of the game. Now, ironically, because Washington has lost more than they won on grass. I can see the conundrum, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be a true factor come Saturday. I I, I don't know if I completely agree because I don't know. If, I, you're right. It's not the biggest factor. And let, 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 me, let me preface this with that. But there is a difference in feeling of playing on grass versus playing on turf. Because oh, yeah. grass just give, it gives so much more. And it's a lot easier to stick your foot in the ground and cut the other way when you're playing on turf. Yeah, it's a little bit more dangerous, you know, with injuries and everything, but that's a whole different discussion. But when it comes to just sticking your foot in the ground and trying to cut the other way, you're way more likely to fall on grass. So, and that's something where if you're not 100% confident in that, it might, you know, you might slow up on some of your cuts and you might not be able to just go 100% in and out of your break sometimes if you're, you know, a receiver or a defensive back, whatever it might be. So I think that that's something that I really do want to watch this Saturday. And Kalen DeBoer said as much today where he said uh, Saturday at the game is not going to be the first time that these players are touching grass this week. And I shout out to, you know, Twitter trolls, touch grass, everything like that. I wanted to get that in there real quick, but um, you know, I, I think that it's something that um, is worth noting. Uh, the Huskies did practice at the Seahawks pra- practice facility, the VMAC down in Renton uh, during fall camp. And I'm curious to see if, you know, obviously the NFL season is back now and the Seahawks get priority at their own facility, but is it something where they might go find a grass field to practice on at some point this week? Yeah. I mean, you, you would have to think so. I mean, that's what we kind of touched on before the show started, which was where are the grass fields around the area? I mean, I don't know if um, Bothell high school, I don't, I believe they play on turf, right? I'm at pop Kenny. I think so. Yeah. And, and Memorial stadium, obviously turf. So, yeah. you know, when you start century link, obviously turf again. So it's one of those where it's like, you know, you don't want to go necessarily to a local high school. Although we did kind of see, I forgot there was years ago where Stanford was doing their walkthrough in like a, a parking <laughs> lot, you know, practicing nope. with geese on the, on the, on the, on the grass. And, and so they that was a downtown park in Bellevue because I lived across the street at the time. And I remember being like, Oh, what's, what's going on? Wait a minute. That's, that's Stanford. So that was, that was, that was fun. Just kind of being around that at the time. Yeah. So I, I don't think the Huskies are going to go to Bellevue park downtown in the middle of uh, especially like, you know, on a, on a Wednesday afternoon, that'd be, that'd be interesting by you. But I, I think that – I don't know if that's necessarily going to be what we see here. But no, it, it's it's going to be a fun story to watch just to kind of see, okay, because they play three games on grass this year. They go to USC, I believe, is one of them at the Coliseum. And then, correct me if I'm wrong, Stanford is the other one? I believe – that sounds right. I mean, because it's not, it's not Arizona. I don't right? think it's Arizona. But yeah, so we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Nobody wants to hear us just uh, think about which 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 fields are grass and which are turf off, off the top of our heads because that is not – we prepare a lot of things for this podcast. 
grass and turf field is not something we are going to be pulling up for the show. Uh, but uh, please go ahead. To that to that point, that 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 you know the fact that there's such a small amount of teams that are now going to be in the, in the former in the conference formerly known as the Pac-12 starting next year, that <laughs> the Pac-2, right? That and and none of the schools involved, I believe, are on grass, right? I know Martin's not, and uh, I don't believe Corvallis in the renovations. I don't believe they put grass in either. So I think. It, it, again, it just kind of underscores my original point of, yeah, it's an interesting anecdote, but I don't necessarily, I mean, I think it's more about the night game element of it. You know, it's like the evening is, is the, is the grass different at night versus if you're playing at 1230. I think that, that may be where it's like, I, your players slip a little more because it's later. It's again, you're playing in mid September, mid to late September. So it's not necessarily November, right. Where you're talking about snow and sure. grass. Cause that, that, that becomes that, a lot. Then, a then, I, yeah. then I, then I buy into it way more because now you're talking about a multitude of elements coming into play. Right. I just take a quick second here to remind everybody that college football season is here in this season. Lockdown is kicking up our coverage with Lockdown College Football Kickoff Live. Each Friday, Lockdown will go live from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on every Lockdown College YouTube channel. So right here on Lockdown Huskies, College Football Kickoff Live will cover playoff implications, conference rivalry games, and go in depth like only Lockdown can, including insight and analysis from our stable of Lockdown College hosts covering their team every day. Find Lockdown College Football Kickoff Live every Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on any Lockdown College YouTube channel, so you can find it right here on Lockdown Huskies. Once again, you won't want to miss it. Okay, last thing here, uh, and we're gonna because we're gonna continue this one on over into the third segment because I think it's it's really fun here. Uh, but we just kind of talked about this is this is a Big Ten preview for the most part. We there's still some questions to be had about what's gonna be set w- with the Big Ten schedule. Yes, Washington Oregon rivalry is intact. That's going to be con- continued as an every year game. Uh, I'll be interested to see if that becomes the uh, the Black Friday game, or instead of the Apple Cup being. The, I I think that's you know something where that's the Ohio State Michigan weekend where, hey, I'm just throwing that out there. That's I think that's possible, but this is going to be the first true Big Ten environment that this team plays in, and. Kalen DeBoer said, we're not really treating it that way. We'll look into like, you know, the travel element of that. We're going to take that into account. But outside of that, we don't really care about that right now. And, but I think it's going to be fun from, and you're going to be there. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fun from, you know, fan and media, just like, I, 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 I was looking for the right word. I'm just going to say from, from your, from your eye, from your viewpoint, uh, the, just what kind of experience that it's going to be. Yeah, it, it's a, you're just you're learning a new environment. I've been to a few different Big Ten environments. I went I went to Michigan in 2021, and actually, I, as you were saying that, there's a number of players on this team. I know Roger Rosengarten was on the team in 21. Like, like no, right? I, yeah, because yep. he he was not he didn't he registered the co- the the COVID year too. So there's a number of players that have at least made those trips to where it's like you're not taking it's not the Jeremy Bernard and Michael Penix are the only two guys that have made that trip, you know. So I think there's there's enough experience to where they're not going to be taking pictures. It's not an environment like that. But I think, you know, it'll be cool for the Parker brothers, which I'm sure we'll talk about later in the week, you know, and Jeremy going back and, and things like that. But again, I don't, it, it's, it's more like what I, what I said the other day, it's a business trip, right? You're just going right. out there. You're going to, they're going out, I believe on Friday, uh, yes. Friday morning. And so you're, you're probably landing probably three or four in the afternoon, maybe. Or I think somebody said Thursday afternoon, but I, uh, it's, it's but, really. Right. Well, we know, we know somebody else who's flying a day ahead for different reasons. Yes. Um, but so that, that I think that's what you're doing. But um, but um, but yeah, no. I mean, the way they're approaching it, it's it's more. I think Caitlin was asked today about can you learn anything from this? Is it you know we're going into the Big Ten, right? It's like, well, I mean, this it's one of a potential what 16, 15, 14, however many schools are in the Big Big Ten now. You're going to be in the big right. So so one of potentially seventeen trips that you might have to make at some point in his career depending on how long he's here but i don't think there's necessarily any it, it's kind of like you know as we as media tend to like oh hey is this a story is this a story is the grass a story is, is traveling and he's glancing a story it's like yeah it is right there's nuances sure. to the story right but again it's not it's not in the top five no top, and, 10, and, top, 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 top 10 probably but not top five and i i like that point a lot because you're right it isn't it isn't one of the key things but it's something where, you know, especially because for us in this standpoint, where we cover this team every day, sometimes we have to dig in and find those nuanced stories. And I think that that's one where we're going to have to discuss this because, yeah, there there are 17 other teams in the Big Ten. Yeah, three of them are on the West Coast, but uh, or coming in 2024, that is. But for all these teams where, you know, it's an environment you haven't really experienced yet because 
Kalen DeBoer didn't make that Michigan trip. He doesn't know what that's like. And yeah, Michigan State is going to be a very different atmosphere. But that's something where he and a lot of the, the support staff, you know, the nutrition team, the strength team, they have things that they want the players to do days before a game. And how does that, you know, how, how does that factor in when you have to take a four or five hour plane ride? Those are things that I think do end up having to play into this in the long run. And, you know, before we jump into our third segment, because these two things are related, I got to take a minute and tell everybody at home about the good people over at FanDuel. Because you can get ready for the NFL season with incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. Okay, we know about everything that's going on at Michigan State. There is a lot of drama over there. We talked about it a little bit on yesterday's show. If more news comes out over the course of the week, we'll probably dive a little bit more into that, depending on, you know, what whatever it might be that comes out. But the one thing right now that we're going to talk about is Washington covering the spread. I'm – we – People who are all you everydayers out there who listen to the show know that I don't give predictions because I am a jinx. No matter what I say, I am going to be wrong. So I'm just willing to take that bullet and I, I have more fun with the bull predictions. But this is something that needs to be talked about right now. Washington is a 16 point favorite on FanDuel. This is not, and that's going on the road. Usually teams get three points for just being at home. So basically FanDuel is saying that Washington can win this is supposed to win this game by three touchdowns. Do you think that's going to happen? So it's interesting. Uh, I was looking at, so we got to remember, uh, Kalen DeBoer does have experience playing in Spartan stadium, not, not, you're not playing, but coaching, uh, at Spartan stadium. He was a part of the mid him and Ryan Grover, a part of the Michigan, Eastern Michigan staff in 2014 that played at East Lansing and lost 73 to 13. I just have a hunch that if this game starts to get out of hand and if, if this thing starts to get interesting, that Grubb is going to have no problem putting his foot on the gas. So I think that – because, again, you, you're you – we talked about this going into the season. Style points matter. If you have a chance to put a 60 on Michigan, on Michigan State in their hometown, you, you're going to do it. You, you're not holding back at that point. And it's kind of interesting that they opened as a 14-point spread. They got two points since the Mel Tucker news came out. But – from the, from from the Saturday night when it got posted to to just now reading it, um, but they, it's I I almost think that means it's trending. It's, you're probably going to see that spread maybe get up to 17 or 18. You know, so I I think if if Washington's offense can do what we expect it to do, it's absolutely realistic to say you could win by three touchdowns or more in East Lansing. I, I will say the the one betting note I will make on this game is that the over under right now is 59 and a half. I, yeah, well, I, 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 I wanted your live reaction to that because you're always, you're always talking to me about the betting lines. And I just wanted to see what you might, you might say to that one. All YouTube viewers saw that, uh, that, that very, very intriguing expression from, from Lars Hansen here. And I think that that's something where, oh, I, I might, you know, if, if, if I were somebody who, you were using FanDuel as, you know, I, we, we have very specific regulations about that here in Washington. I throw some, some money on that over. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's kind of the thing because you're looking at Noah Kim, Michigan state has a decent offense, right? They should, and you know, Washington's defense has been okay. I think we can, we, we've talked about where they can improve and especially right. if, they're, if they're out without Ace and Devon, you know, the secondary takes a hit. So yeah, if I, but again, you know, it's almost like this game goes one of two ways. It goes 21 plus in favor of Washington or it becomes like the Alamo bowl where it's like, it's a lot more low score. We thought this was going to be like a 35, 34, you know, 42, 40, you know, if, if it was going to be close, it would be like that, not 27, 20 and sure. nobody can crack 30. So, I mean, Roma Dunze didn't get a touchdown in the, in the Alamo bowl. Like, it's one of those when I was looking at the stats, you know, going through the season, it's like, wait a minute, Jalen's got consecutive touchdowns, but Rome didn't, it, 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 it seemed like an unorthodox kind of game. It just, everything, the way this is setting up, you know, Jeremy Bernard making his return, the Parker Brothers coming back, every, you know, it just seems like everything is such in Washington's favor. This team, aside from the desert, right, aside from last season at Arizona State, 
this team doesn't lay an egg. And, and it just it's hard to see that duplicating itself this early in the season. And I, I will say, even laying an egg, they scored 38 points in that game. That, and it's I I I, I just I, I I that's that's something that needs to be thrown out there. This team on bad days scores 27, 38, 32 against UCLA. Those were their like the, the closest games they played last year. Yeah, the, the Oregon one counts, but that was a 37-34 ball game. They still scored a lot of points. This this team, you're, you're right. Offensively, they are going to be there week in and week out. They, It feels wild to say this, and I feel like we talked about this after the game too. They only scored 43 points against Tulsa. And there was, there was a metric I saw on Twitter where it was like, uh, how badly did, did my team get beat? Washington had the largest, like whatever, whatever that stat measured, they, they had the biggest beat of the weekend against Tulsa and they yeah. played a really sloppy game. Yeah. I mean, they had probably what three or four less drives than they did against Boise. So that's probably, you're talking at minimum 12 points at most 28, you know, we were, we were talking touchdown. About, yeah. Yeah. It's like, we were talking before the game. It's like, you don't want to sound braggadocious, right? You don't want to sound, oh, they can sing 60, they can sing 70. It's like, but this team really can. It's just a matter of do they, you know, to quote Michael Penix, he didn't really want it. Do they really want it? I don't know. We'll see. Like, if you guys really want it, hang 70 and see what happens. Like, th- th- this is a time to do that. Not against Tulsa when you're playing a team that you know you should beat by three touchdowns. Not a team by like- Tosh. I, you know what? Do it both times. Really. <laughs> Double down. I mean, you know, you're Alex to- Grinch. I mean that that's gonna be a shoot out of the way. I I just I'm gonna die on that hill that that game is just gonna become a shootout, oh, no, which, you're, you're, which you're means right. it's gonna be which means the winner is gonna be 13-10, you know, on a last second field goal. <laughs> gonna be the best defensive battle of the year. Right, exactly. But knowing my luck. <laughs> that's hey, that that's why I wasn't I agreed, and that's why they didn't hang 60, but I wasn't the one who said they were gonna put 60 on Tulsa. But no, I did, is, I, I did say Jeremy Bernard was going to get a touchdown. You did. You got that one right. And you know what? We might have to double that this weekend. Oh, I, I see, actually, that's perfect because that's what I just I wanted to say because that's something that we have to talk about, and we're going to talk about it later in the week. You talked about uh, the media kind of we we have to look for stories sometimes because. It, we want to make sure that we put the most out there for fans, for people who want to be consistently involved in their favorite team, their team every day, some might say. Uh, bang, I, I like that one a lot. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hold the applause. Um, but no, and it's something where Jeremy Bernard signed with Washington, went to Michigan State, is now back at Washington. And we saw how much he can be involved in the offense. And quick side note, this is something I'm going to probably talk about at some point um, inside the Huskies as well. But Somebody was, was saying to me the other day, oh, yeah, well, Denzel Boston, you were talking about how amazing he was throughout fall camp, and he can't get on the field. And I was like, do you th- really think that that's a knock on Denzel Boston? D- have, you, have you seen the way these other receivers are playing? It's <laughs> None of this has anything to do with him, and Jerry Bernard is just poised to have a gigantic weekend against his former team. No, but to that point, I think some of us did think that a certain returning receiver was going to get beat up by Jeremy. And to his credit, he has not let that happen. So no, he is not. And, and, and according to Jamarcus Shepard, that was never going to happen. But that's well, neither here nor there. We, we also have to say, though, to, to that same point, look at how good both of them are, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, that's kind of the ironic problem. Like Washington fans have become so spoiled under Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb. It's like you went from John Donovan, <laughs> Senor Donovan, to Ryan Grubb and Kalen DeBoer, where if you don't put up fifty, you're like, wait, what happened? Like, like or if okay, if you didn't put up thirty five, let's just put the benchmark there. It sure. used to be like the defense was like, hey, if they don't allow what twenty one or more, twenty eight, it was like under thirty, right? It was like the yeah. longest one of the longest streaks in in college football that almost feels like the offense aside from the aside from the uh alamo bowl you know that was like that was the one exception well, and i still cow. put up 27 and cow i mean that, that oh, was true. the other cow game yeah which man hello week four <laughs> hey that's gonna be a different story though that game's at home this time with the, with the purple led light show that we're, we're gonna see for the first time there's a there's a little story for you and the lightning too if you don't recall no, we're not we're not gonna talk about the lightning I had to oh. suffer through that. We all got to suffer through that. 
Uh, I, hey, I was working at a newspaper at the time, and we had to shut everything down early to get home from that lightning storm. But, you know, before we get off track here, that does feel like a good point to wrap this up. Lars Hansen, as always, I want to thank you for being here with me. To everybody out there, all you everydayers, we truly appreciate all your support. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at our thomashop 34 at Lars Hansen, and at Inside the Huskies. Uh, it would just If you ever have questions for us, if there's anything you want to respond to, uh, just you can tweet at any of us. We will probably see it at inside the Husky is going to be your best way to follow. And, you know, uh, the DMS are open there, I believe. So you can always slide in the DMS just say, Hey, I got a question for the mailbag, whatever it might be. We'll find a way to get it on the show and, you know, make sure you continue to like comment, subscribe on YouTube, wherever else you get your podcasts. Again, we truly appreciate all your support. It means a lot to us. We've seen a lot of very kind things that you said. Leave us, leave us a five-star review. If you're a Spotify listener, if you're an Apple Podcast listener, continue to subscribe and leave comments on YouTube. And we will see you tomorrow.